Hi everyone and thank you for joining me. My name is Simon Barnard and I'm the Portfolio Manager for the Smithson Investment Trust. I'm going to take you through a quick update of what happened to the fund in 2020 and then I'll be joined by Will Morgan for the Q&A session. So let's kick off with the presentation. First, I'd recommend that you read this disclaimer. It's a very important notice, um, but perhaps you'll be able to do that in your free time. Moving on to performance. 2020 was a very good performance year for Smithson. The NAV or net asset value was up 31.4% and the share price was up 31.7%. This compares to our benchmark, the MSCI World Small and Mid Cap Index, up 12.2%. This means that since inception in October 2018, the NAV is now at 61%, the share price up nearly 66%, and the benchmark up just over 33%. We've also included on this slide the performance for the first quarter of 2021 on the far left. You can see that this is not quite so strong this year with the NAV down 2.4% and the share price down 3% while at the same time the index is up 6.4%. The main reason for this is that many of the sectors that we choose not to own, like airlines or energy or real estate, have all done well since expectations for inflation and interest rates have increased, while the companies that we own have come off a little in price. Moving on to the next slide and what happened to the fund in 2020, We've shown here the top five contributors and top five detractors. So in terms of contributors, the number one was Ambu. This is a Danish healthcare company which makes disposable endoscopes and their demand benefited greatly during the pandemic as the disposable nature of their products mean that patients and doctors weren't becoming infected by COVID. Massimo is a US healthcare company. They too sell uh, devices into the intensive care units. So as ICUs grew during the pandemic, so too did the demand for their product. Fever Tree Drinks will be familiar to many as a producer of mixers and tonics. This is a little surprising one to be in our contributors, given that the shares did so poorly at the start of 2020 at the onset of the pandemic. And that's because the market was worried that with half of their drinks sold through restaurants and bars, which were obviously closed during the pandemic, that their revenue and therefore shares would suffer. What actually transpired though, is that the other half of their business, which is predominantly supermarkets, almost doubled to compensate. And so for the whole of 2020, their revenue was actually only down around 3%. And during the period of March and April, we were actually buying a lot of shares um, in Fever Tree, which meant that once people realised that the revenue situation wasn't going to be so bad and the shares recovered, the performance for our fund was very strong. Domino's Pizza Enterprises is a Domino's master franchise owner in Australia, New Zealand and a few other territories. They did well during lockdowns as they remained open and were able to deliver to homes while other restaurants were closed. And IPG Photonics, is a high powered laser manufacturer based in the US. They are quite exposed to economic activity, so it's another surprising one to add to the contributors list. But the shares performed very strongly in the second half of 2020 as laser orders from Asia started picking up and therefore indicated a recovery in those economies. On to the detractors, and Sabre was by far and away our number one detractor. Sabre is a software company that supplies to the travel industry. So they are the backbone link between travel buyers, such as travel agents and consumer websites like Expedia, and travel sellers like airlines or hotels. Unfortunately, Sabre's revenue is directly tied to the number of passengers boarded or booked into hotels. So as travelers fell by 90% in March and April last year, so too did their revenue. Sabre also had a bit of debt on the balance sheet which was a further concern. But we spent a lot of time doing in-depth research on the company during March, as well as speaking to the management team a few times, and were able to grow confident that the management were taking enough action to enable Sabre to survive not only that short-term period, 
but for at least two years without any revenue. And that gave us the confidence in the end to begin adding to Sabre in March of 2020. Temenos is a Swiss IT business and they sell software to banks, which includes core banking software as well as software that helps banks digitalize their offer. Temenos had a slowdown in revenue in 2020. Revenues were down around 8% because banks were quite understandably focusing on how to run their business and also the potential loan losses rather than upgrading their IT systems. Temenos is also switching from a license model to a software as a service model or SaaS model. And this too uh, means that the P&L is held back slightly during that transition. For both of these reasons, Terminos shares were uh, underperformers in 2020, but we expect that to reverse once the economy picks up and they are through this SaaS transition. Brightmove will also be well known to many as the online housing portal. They underperformed when the housing, UK housing market was closed for a short period during 2020, uh, which stimulated them to offer estate agents a discount on subscriptions of around 75%, which obviously weighed on revenues and profits for the year. For that reason, Brightmove was an underperformer for us. But again, given the short term nature of both of those aspects, we expect that to return to normal in 2021. <clears throat> Domino's Pizza Group is another Domino's master franchise owner, this time in the UK, uh, Ireland and a couple of European territories. Funnily enough, the UK business was fine and actually was up around 5% for the year as they remained open for most of the time and were able to deliver to homes. But it was their international businesses that suffered a little, dragging the whole group down. And then finally, Diploma. This is an industrial conglomerate uh, distributing anything from hydraulic seals for construction equipment to lavatory instruments. Uh, they, those shares suffered a little as the expectations for ec the economy declined during the start of the year, uh, but recovered by the end. And actually, you can see that although it's a below average contribution, it is still a positive contributor for the year. Finally, on this slide, we have the top 10 holdings on the left. Um, including Sabre as a number one position. That's because we added to it last March and it's done very well since. Um, and a similar story for Rightmove and Fevertree. Just to sum up on this slide, it's useful to explain what we actually did in terms of trading action during the year. And this is a good framework to explain that. As you might imagine, given Ambu and Massimo and another of our healthcare names did extremely well in the early stages of the pandemic, we decided to trim those companies to generate additional capital, which we then reinvested in a few of those companies that were doing poorly in the short term, but we felt would recover um, through the crisis and certainly beyond the crisis. And that included Fever Tree Drinks and Saver, as mentioned, as well as Rightmove and a couple of others. We also bought three new positions during 2020, which will, I will cover a little later. All of these actions meant that um, at the end of the year, and, and we've shown this actually to the end of March to give you the latest data, um, the outcome of the shape of the portfolio is on this slide. We have the sector weightings on the left. You can see information technology appears very large at 45%. I would say that's a little misleading because that se segment is defined by MSCI and not by us. And a few of the companies that they include in information technology, we would probably include in industrials itself instead. So for that reason, we think that information technology is, looks a little higher than reality. On top of which, the information technology companies that we believe should be labelled as such are very diverse in nature and in terms of their end markets. So there is even further diversity within that. Industrials were flat year on year. Um, we did add a name to industrials, which I will cover, um, but other industrials underperformed, which is why the overall weight stayed the same. But healthcare did decline in weighting, and that's because of the trims I just mentioned previously. In terms of country weightings, US remains our largest weighting at 49%. And although that sounds high, you can see in comparison to the index at 58%, it is actually smaller than, than 
uh, as represented in the world index. <clears throat> the UK, however, at 20 percent, I would label as a large weighting. Uh, we're certainly not biased to the UK. Um, this has been formed through a bottom up stock picking approach, as has every aspect of these exposures. Um, and the reality is that since 2016, much of the valuations in the UK market have been depressed. And for that reason, we have found several very high quality companies in the UK trading at somewhat lower valuations than others we see around the world. And for that reason, we own quite a lot of them, which all adds up to the 20% weighting in the UK. I would suspect that over time, as those valuations in the UK normalize, that that weighting of 20% will probably fall. And if we look at the sales exposure by region on the far right, this is the location from which our companies generate revenue. So actually it looks more diverse still. We have Europe as a number one generator of revenue, 39%, North America 35%. And although this is a developed market fund, insofar as we only buy companies listed in developed markets, some of those companies do, of course, generate revenue from emerging markets, and that's why you have some revenue there coming from the Middle East and Latin America. Now on to the Smithson investment strategy. This hasn't changed since IPO and remains the same, also the same as Fundsmith. That is, we buy good companies, we don't overpay, and then we try to do nothing. <clears throat> so to take you through this strategy in turn and how we are doing against that strategy, this slide on the left hand side shows you the average operating metrics for the companies in the Smithson Investment Trust. In the middle, it shows the average for the companies in our benchmark. And in the far right, it shows just for interest, the average operating metrics for those companies in the Fundsmith Equity Fund. So starting with return on capital employed, which is a key measure of quality for us, you can see that in the Smithson Investment Trust, the average is 31%. And that is actually excluding our highest return on capital employed company, which is Rightmove, and that has a return above 700%. If we included that, the average would be much higher. So we exclude it to show the average of the remainder, which is 31%. That compares very favorably to the benchmark at 6% and is very similar to the Fundsmith Equity Fund, which is at 25%. It's got a similar story moving down the page. Gross margin for the Smithson Investment Trust, 65%. This is where our companies are creating their products for a cost of 35 and selling them for a price of 100. You look at the benchmark with a gross margin of 34%, that means that either they are creating their products for a much higher cost or they're selling their products at a lower price. Either way, the margin is almost half as much as that seen in Smithson and Fundsmith. And operating profit margin, again, is far higher than the index. In fact, I go so far as perhaps to say that index looks a little low because of the extraordinary environment we saw in 2020. I would expect that to trend up over time perhaps more to a region of 8 to 10 percent, but in any case, far below the operating profit margin of both Smithson and Fundsmith. And cash conversion was very strong in Smithson, 126 percent. Now, how can you generate more cash than earnings? Well, a couple of ways. The good way is if you are able to get your customers to pay you before you have to pay your suppliers. Then, as the company grows, the pool of cash sitting on the balance sheet, which doesn't technically belong to you, but can be used by you in the meantime, is growing and therefore you are generating more cash than you are earnings in any given year. The other way, which is slightly less good, is if you are paying your employees using stock options instead of cash, and so your cash flow is higher than your earnings in any given year. But of course, that will normalise out over time. And then finally, interest cover. We put interest cover here instead of any other leverage metric because on average, our companies aren't net cash and they don't have any debt. And you can see that 31 times of interest cover is very strong relative to the benchmark. The second aspect, don't overpay. 
Here is a history of the free cash flow yield or valuation of the fund since 2018. So you can see that has been trending down as the portfolio has performed over the last two years, ending up at the end of December at 2.9%, which compares to the index at 3.2%. Now that means that our portfolio is slightly more expensive than the index, but we would make the point that our companies are vastly superior to the average company you see in the index. And so to only be paying a 10% premium for that, we think is in fact very good value. In fact, the growth of our companies over the last year in terms of free cash flow was roughly 10%. We don't have the numbers for the index at the moment, but I would be very surprised if they grew at all. And then the final part of the strategy do nothing. Here we've shown what we actually have done in both 2019 and 2020. And you can see that portfolio turnover, which is the voluntary turnover metric, has gone up significantly. So in 2019, turnover was 6.1%. We felt that that was a relatively normal year, if there is such a thing. But in 2020, given the uh, trims and ads that we mentioned, and also the new positions that you can see, uh, voluntary turnover went up to 21.6%. Now that feels a very busy year for us, but actually in the broad scheme of the asset management industry, that is still very low, bearing in mind that the average of the industry is around 80%. So in terms of the new companies that we bought in 2020, Rationale is an industrial company making ovens. They only sell professional ovens to restaurant kitchens or mass catering venues and they are well known as the best performing ovens for professional chefs. Their technology means that most of their ovens are fully automated, which means that you can just press a few buttons and tell the oven how you want something to be cooked. And the oven then tells the weight, the density, the type of food that it's cooking and how to cook it um, to your specification. It then self cleans itself once you take the food out. Qualys and Fortinet are both in the same industry, but slightly different businesses. That is, they are in cybersecurity. Qualys produces software to protect assets attached to networks, primarily those external to any corporate network. And it's very important, particularly in this period of remote working, with remote assets such as laptops and mobile phones attached to corporate networks, that they are not only fully protected against hacking, but, us, but also that all of their software updates are made frequently to stop any creation of loopholes that hackers can take advantage of. Fortinet is also in cybersecurity, but they focus on appliances such as firewalls. And in fact, it's a very similar business to Checkpoint, which we sold during the year. Now, the reason why we bought Fortinet and sold Checkpoint is because although we liked Checkpoint when we bought it in 2018, over the next two years, we discovered that their revenue growth reduced significantly to being only a low single digit in the last reported period. And at the same time, their very high margins were being eroded by management deciding to spend on sales and marketing to try and accelerate that revenue growth, which it turned out that wasn't quite working. At the same time, Fortinet has been growing consistently at around 20% and their margins have also been increasing. And given that they are in the same industry, we thought it made a lot of sense to switch from Checkpoint into Fortinet. And finally, just to finish on what we've been doing so far in 2021, we've actually bought two companies and sold one company. Rollins is a pest control company based in the US. This is a company we've admired for a long time but actually the valuation wasn't quite good enough for us to initiate a position. That changed at the start of 2021 when they reported good results, but which weren't taken very well by the market. So the stock sold off and we took our opportunity to start a position. Wingstop is a new position that we're announcing today. We started acquiring Wingstop shares last month, but because we hadn't finished building that position, we didn't announce it to the market. Wingstop is a franchise business selling chicken wings. Starting in the US, they now have over a thousand franchise restaurants 
some internationally as well, with a couple in the UK. I suggest you look them up. And we also sold Abcam, which is a UK-based life sciences business. Abcam has somewhat changed their strategy over the last five years to start buying uh, new types of technology for the group um, at ever increasing prices, as well as the fact that um, with reasonable results at the end of last year, the shares have done very well. So based on the valuation that we saw today and the uncertainty of the new growth strategy ahead, we decided to sell out of the position. And to finish up the presentation, we thought it would be worth discussing our ESG policy. Our general approach to ESG considerations is that we take all of these into account from the very start of our research process, because we want to make sure that we've investigated all of the factors that would impact the potential for a business to sustain its high returns long into the future. But I thought it would also be helpful to share with you a few statistics based on the companies in our portfolio, because although we do focus very much on companies that have good ESG metrics, they are of course not perfect. So looking at environmental, 47% of our portfolio companies now report their CO2 emissions. The lowest emitting is Rightmove at only 600 tonnes per year, whilst the highest is A.O. Smith, a US boiler manufacturer, and they produce 138,000 tonnes a year. Interestingly, the average emissions for the whole portfolio is around 105,000 tonnes, and this compares very favourably to the MCI world average, which is 5.1 million tonnes per company. There are several companies in our portfolio that have already committed to significantly reducing or even net zero carbon emission targets, and these include AMBU, MSCI and Veresk, but there are also several others. In terms of social aspect, women now make up 25% of portfolio company boards. This isn't particularly good, but it is slightly better than the global average of 20%, and we will continue to push our companies to improve that number. In terms of corporate governance, we vote all of our proxies, and we don't use a proxy advisory service. And of all of those proxies that we did vote, 37 of those we voted against the management recommendation for remuneration policies. And in terms of shareholder proposals, that was even higher. We voted against management 80% of the time. Smithson is also on the Fundsmith Stewardship and Sustainability Committee. And as many of you may already know, Fundsmith are also signatories to the UNPRI. So with that, let's turn over to the pre-submitted questions and Will Morgan will join me to help answer those. So the first question, I assume that the free cash flow yield is lower this year than last. Any insight upon the mix of hopefully one-off COVID negative impact versus higher market valuations would be useful? Sure, interestingly, our companies have grown their free cash flow on average over 2020. So funnily enough, that is slightly different to the number of companies that have grown revenue. So around 66% of our companies in the portfolio have grown revenue in 2020, whereas 81% grew their free cash flow. And the reason for that difference is that many of those companies that were having a decline in revenue could well have conserved their cash. So either they were running down inventories or perhaps they were spending less on capital expenditures, which meant that they were able to grow their free cash flow despite a slightly worse operating environment. So actually, the one-offs may have been a positive free cash flow for 2020, which of course we would assume would normalise in 2021 and beyond, just like we would assume the normalisation of the negative impact. So actually, I would say that overall, the free cash flow yield that we're seeing on the portfolio isn't too uh, distorted by any particular one-offs in 2020. Thank you. On to our second question. Do you have any examples of portfolio companies which are now expected to, to be significantly more dominant in their respective niches due to COVID market changes or insolvencies? Yes, we have quite a few examples, actually. I mean, thankfully, I would say the majority of the companies we are invested in have expressed uh, 
confidence that they will emerge from this crisis in a stronger position than when they went into it. I think the examples kind of fall into two categories. The first is companies that are sort of dominant in an area where that technology will perhaps grow in importance relative to competing technology. So that's particularly true in areas such as medical equipment. One obvious example is Ambu that makes disposable endoscopes. Clearly, the fact that these can prevent infection over ones that are reusable has been incredibly important during COVID. And actually, if you look at their endoscope sales in 2020, they grew over 80%. Uh, obviously, once they have achieved that kind of penetration into hospitals, uh, they can potentially be permanently taking share over the um, reusable version. So that is something that I think has helped sort of accelerate the penetration of that technology into the market. Another example is Massimo. Massimo does uh, effectively non-invasive monitoring of things like your blood oxygen levels. So think about clips that go on the end of your finger, perhaps. That's obviously been hugely important when you're dealing with COVID patients. Uh, and they've seen you know, big increases last year in terms of sales to hospitals of their monitoring devices. But Massimo's products can do all kinds of remote patient monitoring, which is clearly desirable in a world of COVID. But now more hospital beds than ever have a Massimo monitor attached to them. Uh, but not all of those beds are anymore being used for COVID patients. So what that should enable them to do is expand more into other areas of medicine, which they've been looking to do. And again, this is an example of COVID accelerating the penetration of their technology. Now, there are some other companies, which I guess is the other category, that have really been able to take share from their competitors because of their stronger financial position or greater focus. Um, a couple of examples are companies that actually had a lot of challenges in their end markets. The first one would be, I guess, Rationale in Germany that makes professional ovens. They had a pretty tough year of sales, down over 20%. Um, that said, because they have no debt at all and cash on balance sheets, they actually managed to undertake an entire product overhaul during the year of the pandemic, basically launching a whole new range of products that put them very much at the top uh, of the market in terms of spec and levels of automation. And as a result, their sales were okay down over 20% in the year, but actually not that far short of what they achieved in 2017 which when you think that they're in market is essentially places where you eat in public, a lot of which is restaurants, uh, that is pretty good going, we would say. And there's clearly a sign that they've taken market share over competitors that have had much bigger balance sheet issues. Uh, and the final example uh, of that type would be perhaps Sabre. Again, a very tough year for them, given their exposure to airline and hotel bookings, etc. But they have been taking share of uh, the number three competitor in the market, which is Travelport, which has had more balance sheet issues. And therefore, you know, that is an example of a company that's weathered a very tough situation, but we hope should emerge actually in a slightly stronger competitive position at the end of all of this. Thank you. What sort of recovery are the management of portfolio companies guiding for this year and next? Yes. Yeah, so I should probably say at the beginning that we don't tend to put a huge store in management guidance, partly because we don't really believe in people's ability to forecast things incredibly accurately. Um, that said, around 60% of the companies we own in the portfolio provide some kind of guidance. And the most consistent item guided to is revenue. So if we take those 60% of companies, the simple average of revenue growth that they are expecting for the coming year is 11%. Now, those same companies, if we look at what they actually achieved in the prior financial year, they achieved 8% growth. So if you just take that sample alone, they clearly are looking for an acceleration of some sort. Profit guidance for those companies is a little bit more vague. Our best guess would be that on average, they're guiding to margins around stable. Um, so perhaps profit growth could be something similar, but I think we would rather just stick to what they're saying on the on the revenue side. For the 40% of our companies that don't provide any kind of guidance, I should say that the vast majority of them, I think clearly the expectation is that things should be improving from here. Um, but that gives you, I think, a, a reasonable idea of what people are expecting. 
We have a question on the campaign in the property sector to boycott right move. Silver Lake partners have apparently offered incentives for real estate agents to switch to Zoopla. Have you engaged with the company about this and do they have a strategy to ward this thread off? Yes, we've engaged with Rightmove a few times on this actually. <clears throat> we tend to speak to Rightmove three or four times a year. In the last few times, we've discussed both the uh, Say No to Rightmove campaign and um, the other incentives uh, offered by others. So in terms of Say No to Rightmove, this is a uh, group of many estate agents that claim to have clubbed together to boycott Rightmove in protest at its pricing. Uh, but speaking to Rightmove, they tell us that actually only around 10 estate agents uh, have actually left Rightmove or permanently left Rightmove, I should say. A few did right at the start, but quickly rejoined Rightmove after they saw the impact on their business of leaving Rightmove. Uh, and second, I think the only point I'd make uh, with regards to agents being given incentives or payments to join another subscription service is I think that tells us a lot about the difference in quality between Rightmove services and Zoopla services. Will the emergence out of the pandemic affect stock picking for the fund? Um, no is the short answer. I mean, we have a long term strategy that we will continue with. However, I think it is fair to say that although we look at very long term themes in terms of our companies being able to sustain their returns on investor capital for a long time, clearly the pandemic has accelerated the effect of many of these long term themes. And I think perhaps a good example of companies that may benefit from accelerations such as these are Qualys and Fortinet, which of course we added to uh, last year. Um, and we were certainly cognizant of the fact that remote working or more remote working will benefit those companies in the future. So while the overall strategy and the stock picking won't change, I think certain companies may well have benefited from the pandemic and make them look more attractive to us than they did before. Good. The trust has grown spectacularly since inception and is now one of the largest investment trusts. Despite this, you only have a modest number of holdings of increasing magnitude in companies, some of which are of modest size. Do you have guidelines as to the proportion of a company's equity you are willing to own? And are you planning to increase the number of holdings? So we do have guidelines. And according to the prospectus, which is available on the website, you can see it there, we are allowed to own up to 20% of the share capital of any of the companies we invest in. That said, we would probably think long and hard uh, before going over a level of 10%. And we certainly do not at this time expect to go beyond that kind of ownership level uh, in any company's share capital. In terms of the number of companies we own, we currently own 32 today. That's the largest number we've had. We started out with uh, 29, so we've sort of been in that kind of range. We are able to own up to 40 companies, so we could clearly have more. That said, the number of companies we own is never a specific target that we set ourselves. It is purely the result of a bottom up process where we are looking for companies with the optimal combination of quality, value and growth. Uh, and certainly we would never manage the funds with a certain number of companies and especially not for reasons of capacity management or anything like that. To what extent could Smithson become a feeder fund for the Thumbsmith Equity Fund as successful growing businesses outgrow Smithson and are of the size that are attracted to Fundsmith? Yeah, well, I think I think that's very possible. Um, and, you know, when we look back at the reasons why Smithson started in the first place, I mean, the primary reason was that uh, Terry Smith observed that uh, a lot of companies that had outperformed uh, his funds with equity fund were in the small and mid cap space. So therefore, a fund uh, that focused on those could do very well. That was the primary reason. Uh, but the secondary reason was also that um, he could form a team to look at these small and mid cap stocks that would or could eventually grow into companies that would be interesting for the funds with equity fund. So in some ways, it's in the DNA of Smithson. Um, and one practical example is a company called Viva Systems, which is a US company that provides software uh, to the life sciences industry. Uh, that used to be in our investable universe, 
which is what we call our long list of companies that we uh, look at, research, and um, look to put in the portfolio when appropriate. So uh, that was originally in our investable universe, but grew too large and has now moved into the Fundsmith investable universe. So that is one example of that actually already occurring. Did you miss any investment opportunities in the sell-off in 2020 due to more markets moving too quickly? Uh, well, <laughs> the, the answer is yes and no. I mean, everything fell uh, precipitously and then rebounded. So you could say that everything was an opportunity at that period. Um, but the reason I say also no is because uh, we did buy uh, a few uh, companies, some of which we already owned, uh, one or two which we didn't. Um, so Sabre, for example, uh, since we started buying last March, is up nearly four times over that period. Uh, we bought Fever Tree quite aggressively over the uh, subsequent period that's up nearly three times. And uh, Rationale, which we bought last March, uh, that is almost doubled in the year. So um, those were the main uh, sources of our investment during that period, and I don't think we've done too badly with those. Um, and at the same time, um, we invested every penny we had during that period. So we did a lot of trading in March and April, and we were down to absolutely zero cash. And that was after raising additional capital from trimming the medical device companies that I mentioned during the presentation. So ultimately, although we could see many more opportunities around us, we had already spent uh, all of the capital available to us in those uh, three companies and a couple of others that also did well subsequently. So I feel that we did all that we could to take advantage of uh, the uh, decrease in share prices during that period. Have any new companies entered into your investable universe and how many have been taken out due to M&A? Yes, so we have uh, seen quite a lot of change in the investable universe and I should note that that's the one area where we would expect to see more turnover than we perhaps see in the portfolio. Uh, since when we started, we had 83 companies in the investable universe. We're now down to 75. In that time, we've had five new companies that have gone in. Uh, we've had 11 that have come out either due to them getting too big. Um, and actually one of those companies that went in also then later went out from getting too big. And that was Viva Systems, which Simon was talking about just now. Um, and some of them may be just quality. We think that ultimately their companies were unlikely to own and that's why they leave the universe. And then two left because of takeouts. And that was CIZ uh, in Japan and also Duncan Brands in the United States. You own two different Domino's positions. What makes their model stand out and justify the big combined exposure? So there are some slight nuanced differences in the two business models, often about things like how they make money out of dough, for example, but really the two main areas of difference that allow us to own them together are first of all geography. Uh, clearly the UK franchise mainly operates in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. There are some small European markets that it is largely exiting. Uh, the Australian franchise obviously operates in Australia and New Zealand, but also in Japan, uh, Benelux, France, other areas of Europe. The only overlap actually is a JV that the two companies have together in Germany. But really the difference is actually the kind of investment case. If we look at the Domino's Pizza UK, We've always felt that the UK actually is one of the most attractive markets for a franchisee to operate in because of the potential profitability that's there uh, for the stores. Now, that said, over the recent years, we believe that the company has not necessarily been run in the optimal way. And it's certainly got to a stage where some large franchisees control too much of the network, in our view. Um, and that's led to some disputes with the management and has led to a degree of inertia really at the group overall. Now that is something that has been changed a lot recently and we've seen a big overhaul in both the non-executive board and the executive and we believe that the prospects of this company should be pretty strong from here as a result. So really it's about taking a fundamentally strong business and optimising uh, what it delivers. The Australian business is slightly different, although I should say that when we bought it, we had an opportunity to buy it at the launch of the fund because it actually itself was suffering due to perceived strains with its own relationship with franchisees in its domestic market. 
But since then, what they've really been able to do is demonstrate their ability to grow into overseas territories. They've been very successful in Japan, uh, also growing in Europe, and that really gives them a huge amount of opportunity to execute on further growth. And we have confidence in that because really we've always seen the Australian franchisees as really some of the best operators in the overall Domino's network globally. And so there is that slight difference in nuance between the two different investment cases. And that's why we're happy owning them two together uh, in the fund. Do you have to sell a company when its market cap exceeds 15 billion pounds? No, is the answer. We don't have to sell it. Um, we'd only ever buy a company when it is below 15 billion initially. Um, but if it were to do well and go through 15 billion, we don't have to sell it. And, uh, and that makes sense to us because ultimately, if a company is doing well and growing and compounding, that is the reason we want to own it anyway. Now, over time, as that company gets bigger and bigger, I would suspect that it would get to a point where it no longer competed its way into the portfolio, um, either through its growth or valuation compared to everything else that we could buy in the portfolio. And at that point, we would choose to sell it and reinvest the money in something that looked more attractive. But at no point would we be forced to sell it. Thank you. And the final question here. In the owner's manual at launch, you did a back test on the Smithson Investable Universe over one, three and five years. With markets seemingly high, if you were to do the same back test now, would you get similar results? Also, from this point going forward, how do you see potential future returns compared to the fantastic returns achieved so far? Yes, so we have gone and uh, done a comparison and actually the owner's manual that is on the Smithson website has actually been updated for data as of the uh, end of last year. So um, that's something you might want to take a look at to refresh your memories on all that kind of stuff. Um, but we have looked at the numbers. So um, we have some here and forgive me if I uh, refer to these notes so that we can uh, give you a, a, an accurate answer. Um, but effectively, if we look at the, um, the first thing I should say is that the two investable universes are slightly different. In the original owner's manual, we had 83 companies, obviously, and now we only have 75. So there is a slight apples to oranges comparison there. So that needs to be borne in mind. Having said that, if we look over the one year return of the latest update, it is 28.9%, um, which is actually slightly above the 28.3% that we showed over one year in the original test. The biggest point of difference is over three years and over three years, um, the annualized return, so the sort of per annum return uh, of the current IU would be 22% uh, annualized over the last three years. Whereas when we did the original test back in 2018, uh, that was 30.4%, so significantly higher. Uh, as we mentioned before, different companies to some extent, um, but also the market over that period uh, did actually perform notably worse than it did over the um, uh, three year period trailing when we originally did that test. Um, over five years, actually, the markets performed in fairly similar ways in both tests. Um, that said, uh, on the most recent one, the return was 25.8% annualized, and that is a bit lower than the 29.6% before. Although I think in the grand scheme of things, these are still pretty attractive returns, and certainly attractive returns relative to the MSCI World Small and Mid-Cap Index over those periods. Uh, in terms of where future returns could go, the simple answer is we have no idea and we certainly wouldn't want to suggest that what has been achieved so far it will run into the future. Um, what we can say is that when we are allocating any new incremental capital into the fund, uh, we always aim to allocate it to stocks that we believe have a combination of growth and current valuation that should be able to deliver a total shareholder return equal or in excess of 10% in the long term. So that is what we're always aiming to do. Um, where returns go from one year to the next and what is ultimately achieved over the long term, however, we simply are unable to say. Thank you very much.